where do we start? Swiftly. Swiftly. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, well, this um, film is obviously called Two and a Half Questions. Um, and what we did was ask the same two and a half questions to a number of people from age, age ranging from 16 to something. 14 to 86, love. Well, yeah, but then you're giving away something, love. Well, you've just said. You've I know, I was, I was started, but then I was going to. We made the film with a bunch of young people in Lambert. <laughs> Let's not talk about the film. See it, and then yes. we'll talk about the film. Yes, there you go. So we made it with a, bunch, uh, a group of young people uh, throughout lockdown, so there's like three different stages. The project's supposed to last like a, like a year, I mean, about two and a half. But anyway, so we got the film out in the end, and so um, thank you all so much for coming out today to watch it, and I hope mm. you enjoy it. Yeah. And I think we should just. We'll just play it. So. Get to it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you got um, questions? I do have a few questions. Oh, wow! He's doing his homework! Wow, okay, um, proper. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how the film came about, especially how you uh, made it by um, training young people to make films at the same time as making the film? Mm -hmm. um. Um, so yeah, we um, kind of got permission by Lambert to create a film, but also about kind of, you know, to train young people, but um, and yeah, I mean the idea really, um, <coughs> God, I mean, I Clovis sat on the idea for about 10 years. <laughs> it's basically what happened. Yeah, this idea for the film, two and a half questions, and just talk to as many different black people from Windrush area, Windrush generation as especially, and just see what they think. And then Clovis sat on the idea for about 10 years. Yeah. It's basically what happened. Yeah, this idea for the film, two and a half questions, and just talk to as many different black people from Windrush generation especially, but all the way down, and it'd be really great. And I said, yeah, that sounds really great. And then nothing happened. And then this opportunity came to do some work with young people. I said, Clovis, you remember that idea you had about the two and a half questions? He was like, no, that's my art. And um, <laughs> yeah. I said, too bad, because you've been sitting on your art for 10 years, you had your chance. You're going to do this. <laughs> Yeah, so we had to shift it a little bit. Um, yeah, because, as um, Marcia said, it was an artistic idea. Um, and originally, the kind of, it wasn't necessarily two and a half questions, but it was kind of like one question. I wanted to, here's the question. It was, um, who are you without referring to your occupation or anything okay. else or your family yeah. or family yeah. yeah um so i wanted to i wanted to originally i wanted to document people talking about who they feel they are you know it's a very deep question that not many people can answer um but yeah but then like i said yeah Marsha pretty much honed the idea down to kind of like these two and a half questions um but yeah but it was made kind of during lockdown, so it started, the project started just before, we lockdown. Just before lockdown. Yeah, so we had all these great plans of, um, you know, we started off training young people, getting them looking at photography and then video on um, videography, um, teaching them how to use the equipment and lighting and all the rest of it, so all the stuff that would go into basically making, creating anything rather than, you know, photography or video. Um, and. Uh, then it would, you know, then once they learn how to use equipment, it would be then, they would then start to ask their friends and families and people that they wanted to interview the same two and a half questions and, you know, but then lockdown happened and we had to stop and then we had to, then once the kind of, it eased a bit, we got some other, you know, we got some people, some of them dropped out, some, some remained and it was just that on and off, on and off process throughout lockdown basically. So yeah, that's kind of like the process of, you know, I mean, training young people and um, yeah, the idea coming yeah. together. And because the project, and because all that training element took about two or three times longer than it should have done, because we kept having to stop and start, stop and start. Um, basically, the project was ended, and the money was done, and then like the other ways to go on. So we just did this mad scrabble at the end with the, the, the little one or two young people that we had still left throughout that ridiculous process. Um, and they, and yeah, we just sort of, but also again, because we wanted more older people, we really wanted to get like, you know, the 70, 80, 90 year old 
But, um, you know, right, emerging from lockdown, it just wasn't possible. You know, like a couple of those you had to film in gardens and things, you know, just because, you know, we still had social distancing and stuff in place. A lot of them yeah. had been shielded, it just didn't feel like the right answer. Can I bring a group of young people to your house and ask you questions? <laughs> so, um, I didn't want to go around the country as well. We didn't want to be yeah, London only, exactly, but, you yeah. know, barely went on a bus during that period, so, like, that wasn't going to happen. And so it, it changed a lot in terms of who we wanted to ask. Um, but we're still looking at ways that we can maybe expand it a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. so you'd like to sort of interview people from other parts of the country and... Well, see, this, this is the brilliant thing about doing these Q&As, because this thing is... This, this thing... This wonderful film. <laughs> We've been working on it so long, we forgot what the original idea was. The original oh. idea was always to make a film, but then put it on a website and allow people to then upload. do their own interviews yeah. and upload it. So then yeah. it becomes this sort of, hopefully, this like a amazing database. archive of yeah. people asking the questions. So, and we only just remember mm. that, I think, we're at QA last, last week. week. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're yeah. So we might look and see if we can do that. Yeah. Oh, that would be like a fitting yeah. end to it, and then everyone can use it and have access to it. So yeah. So, so we're going to get yeah. this giant, like I said, archive or okay. database. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, because you just. just yeah. Upload your answers to the questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so that would be that would be a nice way to kind of fully kind of close it off. Yeah. yeah. I imagine you have you'd have very different experiences from different parts of the country and Yeah, we um, knew that. And some of that we I think because a lot of people well, a few of the people were sort of on the outskirts of London, because obviously Lambeth's a very diverse bar and you know, you're gonna get a certain kind of experience there. But a lot of the you saw some people were saying how there were any black people in their school and you know, and quite younger as well. And so I think that um, yeah, if we'd gone further out I think we'd just got a different kind of experience. Yeah. And um, which is we would have wanted to capture. Yeah. We just, you know. I love how it was edited in the earlier bit where you had several people all sort of talking about their experience and you cut between them. It was as if it was just one person speaking because their experiences were so shared. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, the, the editing process was, um, it was crazy because there was, I mean, hours and hours and of, hours and hours of footage. Um, I mean, the, some of the interviews were like 45 to an hour long. <laughs> some people could, you know. They just they would just talk. They would have lots. Of, they would just keep talking, and things would keep coming up. And you know, so it's kind of finding a way to kind of weave what people were saying and kind of follow on from each other, and you know, to make a kind of narrative really out of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it was tough to kind of yeah kind of weave that together. But yeah, and you know, like I said, it's it's tough when you've got a lot of people's opinions, but I mean obviously as well, there's a lot of ums and ahs and, <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that in there, so. Were you yeah. quite surprised that people talked for as long as they did? Were you expecting them to sort of give you 10 minutes and then 10 minutes per question? Sort of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it was interesting. I mean, what I thought was really interesting is that the number of topics that they covered, mm. I mean, we just asked them, how has your race shaped who you are? And what's your hope for the future? Mm -hmm. um, and people just went. They just went for it. I mean, it was almost like a, you know, they they had a chance to speak, and so they were just like, okay, well, yeah, and it's this, and then, and as they talked, they would remember things that happened, mm -hmm. and so they would start to, you know, just keep recalling things and you know going on, and it was, it was just, it was just great. I mean, I also thought it was really great for the young people because the it wasn't me behind the camera. Um, like I said, I, I taught the young people how to light it, how to mic it, how to use the, comp, um, use the camera. So I would just be there to kind of supervise. Um, and so I, we, we'd get to a place, we'd get to a location where we were shooting, and we would go, right, set it up. <laughs> um, set, it, set, set it up, ask the questions, and, you know, and that was, that was the whole point of it. I mean, I, I wanted as you know, I wanted as little to do with it as possible. <laughs> so yeah. That's the whole point. I mean, yeah. I've, I've trained you to do this, so do it. And that's the whole point of like um, learning and doing. It's, it's yeah. the whole point. It's like you know, putting learning into action. 
Sorry. I just wanted to ask, how did you actively get people involved? So did you find that it was easy going out and pinpointing who you'd like to get involved in the film? And <coughs> was that an easy process? We always, we, we've kind of drawn up a list, because like I said, we'd hoped everyone who's been involved was going to be able to bring at least, you know, two or three people to the table and then um, we'd have a kind of range of people to invite. But we also wanted them to sort of pick aspirational people that they didn't know and we'd just see if we could get them. Um, but I think as, it be, as COVID went on and on, it became really good. We just started pulling together the different people we even we knew from different circles, in essence. Um, and... You know, most of them said yes, a few of them said no. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, no, people were actually really generous with their time. Obviously, we had a few Lambeth people in there because it was Lambeth funded, and so they got them for us, um, which was great. I mean, they were really supportive. But I think that um, it was really at the end, it was it was partly our, con our contacts um, and sort of the, our contacts, contacts list. A lot of our friends brought in other people as well to, uh, to be interviewed who they thought had interesting stories to tell in essence. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, and also it's, um, it was tough during lockdown, I mean, as well. I mean, yeah, trying to get access to people and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was interesting. Trying to get people. Yeah, I was going to say that because we did shoot it right after sort of things started opening up again, and I think it would have been a different film if we filmed it before, because people had been inside for a very long time <laughs> thinking <laughs> about stuff. <laughs> so while it was a, a real pain in lots of different ways, it was really I think that kind of that kind of timing was quite fortuitous for us because I think we. I think people were in a more reflective mood mm -hmm. and were ready to sort of, I mean, one of them just wrote, literally wrote pages, she like wrote this whole essay yeah. and she was reading yeah. for it, like she really yeah. was just like... She turned up, not necessarily yeah, to... Yeah, script! Yeah, <laughs> not, 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 yeah, not even to like to, you know, she's like, yeah, she, she said she stood, stayed up the night before yeah. and was just writing out, yeah. like, yeah, she, like I said, she was like... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Do you think that some of them were excited just because they'd not been asked these questions before? I think it's a mix of not being not being asked those questions or not being asked questions, but also as well, I mean, the question kind of constantly being on your mind, especially in during that time. We had George Floyd, we had Black Lives Matter, yeah. we had, you know, so many different kind of cultural things or race things or things that were basically, you know, because of race happening in and around that time that... I think people were kind of, you know, thinking about it, mm -hmm. but never had necessarily had a, a chance to say it, or they would talk to their friends or would talk to people, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time it's like, you know, you would talk about the issue, but not necessarily about how it affected you. So once they were asked that, I think it was a, 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 a chance for them to go, yeah, no, actually, this happened to me, and this happened to me, and ah, mm -hmm. and yeah, this was because of my race, and this... You know, so yeah. Yeah, we made sure to give them the questions in advance so they knew what were going to be asked. Yeah. So, yeah. And so they could prepare on some level. But yeah. 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 It's a bit of a treat as well to be given like full attention and talk as long as you want. You don't have to, you know, because a lot of conversations happen over social media. Yeah. You know, where it's just baiting like two sentences at a time. Yeah. It must have been a treat to be able to just completely sort of go yeah. for 45 minutes and. Absolutely. I mean, how many conversations do you feel are kind of like you're not heard it? You yeah. know, like you're just, all people are listening just so they can get in there. You yeah. know, and so, yeah, the luxury of having a mic and a camera put on you and you're just allowed to mm -hmm. speak your truth. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, yeah, also, as well, I think, um, I think someone said that it, it was a lot easier because it was a bunch of black people behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And they felt freer to just, you know, just to talk. I mean, it's, I mean, I think the person actually said, yeah, if it was a, a BBC film crew, I wouldn't have said half the stuff I said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that, in and of itself, um, was a, also was a bonus to the fact that you know to help people feel comfortable. And I think that's why it's important that, um, yeah, black people. Or people from any kind of, you know, area can have the chance to speak to themselves or have the opportunity to 
feel free and relaxed to express yourselves and say what you want to um, without self-censorship, you know, and that's, I think, one of the, you know, kind of important things. I mean, we censor ourselves, I mean, I think a lot of black people censor themselves a lot in society, in your day-to-day -day lives. You know, you see something, you're forced to just go, oh, that's, that's a bit, that, that don't seem right, but I can't say nothing because let's just keep, let's just go about my day because it will ruin my day if I engage in on that, on that level. So, well, yeah, we kind of censor ourselves enough. Yeah, and I think there were a few people who probably said no because they didn't want their thoughts captured on the camera yeah. <laughs> forever. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and you know, there's nothing you can do about that really. So, but yeah, no, definitely echoing really the importance of having, you know, because I was really proud of the fact that they were not just, they were black females behind the camera. I really like that. Because <laughs> um, that's so rare, you know. Um, but I think it's really important because we're doing another project at the moment around. Um, yeah black dancers in British ballet, I'm not here to talk about that, but um, that's also what we found is that, because obviously they're working in an environment there where they usually are very extreme minorities, you know, they're one, they're probably the only black person in the room, nine times out of ten, and so we know that they told us that they wouldn't have been able to speak in the way that they speak if it had been still white people behind the camera, it needed to be black people who wouldn't sort of raise an eyebrow when they said I was treated badly because of this or I didn't get that job because of you know, we, they needed to be believed in that in what they were saying, and so it definitely makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Were you only focusing that film on um, black um, British uh, ballerinas? Yes. Because we've got a relative who's a ballerina, but she's um, a Canadian, but she's actually a professional ballerina. Yeah. So we we've got so it's based on the PhD work of one of our directors, and it's a it's, we've we've had to sort of limit the remit, otherwise we can do it in essence. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is focus on dancers from the last century. So there are dancers from different countries who came mm -hmm. over here and had a career. So there's South African, there's um, maybe an American, I can't remember, but mm -hmm. that, that yeah came here. But as long as they worked and stayed, you know, had a significant career here, then they're within the project. And then there's a lot of Black British dancers who couldn't be employed over here. So most of their careers were in America or elsewhere abroad, but they're part of our project because they were trained here. So, yeah, there's a bit of a mix, but it is last century. That's where the focus particularly is. For us, the idea, the hope is we pass it on to a ballet company and they continue to do the work we need to be doing about documenting the dancers that are working currently. But we had to limit it because, um, uh, you yeah, know, we just didn't have capacity to do everyone that was working in the field. Not that there's that many, but it would probably double what we were doing, and so it's sort of limited to that. Mm -hmm. There's a black ballerina from Sierra Leone who grew up in America and is now with the Dutch National Ballet. Okay. Yes. No, there are a few now. Um, I think what's... Um, so the dancers, as I said, we really focused on the ones that were... So they, most of them aren't dancing anymore, a couple of them are, because most of them were trained, said, in the 70s and 80s. Is actually reducing number, but there's a real issue around. Um, there's black dancers who train here who cannot get a career in a British ballet company, and ballet's international any, anyway. It always has been, and so they'll you know they'll audition in Germany or wherever. But there is, if you look at even now, if you look at the major ballet companies, your English, your Royal, your what's the other one, Birmingham, there's probably about two or three black British dancers across the three of them. And they, that, that's companies of like 100 people. But uh, so that's so that's part of the issue. It's partly obscured by they will hire in black dancers from Cuba and America and elsewhere. But in, in terms of that homegrown pipeline, it's not there. And so we're trying to understand why that is in essence. So yes, there's a lot of foreign dancers from who are black who work over here and work across Europe and America, but. We again limited the capacity. We're not trying to fix the world. But we'd love to fix the world. <laughs> we're just gonna <laughs> <laughs> one day at a time. So we're gonna we will be focused on. Um, I like I said, since you really had trouble getting into the Dutch National Ballet Company. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, actually it's actually started in the um, dance school of Harlem. Yes, dance theatre Harlem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of our dancers were there. Yeah. yeah. So um, cause it's the only place at the time. In yeah. essence. So, Sorry, I digress. The no, I no, swayed no. the conversation <laughs> next to you, so you can go back. Sorry, thanks. Are you guys are all from London? 
Are we? From Lambeth as well. As in born and bred? No. We uh, <laughs> live there now. We live there now. Yeah. I'm South East London. She's South East, I'm South West. Five, oh, okay. five, <laughs> five years stint in, the, um, in America. I was there five years and then I came back and I was everywhere in London. But we, um, have, we both lived in, we both lived in Brixton. Yeah. Because, yeah, Lambeth kind of gets, is, is the borough mm. which houses a lot of it, but the where we are based is Brixton. We're not based in Brixton. We live in Stratton. Oh, okay. We a company. Are a company. <laughs> That's fine, right? No, um, yeah, we lived in Brixton. Basically, we got older, we started moving out. That's what yeah. happened. <laughs> we moved yeah, a little bit. We loved it. Yeah, yeah, we loved Brixton. Yeah, we were Can't in Brixton, and then you get a bit older and it gets a little bit too hectic, so you move out a little <laughs> bit. And so we move up, we move up to, we move from Brixton Central to like Brixton Hill, <laughs> and then after Brixton Hill, it was like, yeah, let's just move to Streatham. You know, so trying to get me to Croydon. I, I didn't try. I didn't try. I didn't try. I, no, 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 from your experience, like filming this, and what, what, what's your take, or what you always learn as you go? What impression have you got from it? Especially from the older generation, are they saying racism is getting better or getting worse? Oh, a lot of the, a lot of the generation, the older generation, have seen it completely change um, from bad, and. From their eyes, a lot of them still um, feel that it's got worse. Um, I was born in the 70s, um, and I personally feel that it's got worse, but it's got worse in a more sophisticated way, um, in as much as uh, I think people's mentality hasn't changed. I think a lot of a lot of um, white society's mentality is still quite racist. I mean, and a lot of us kind of look to look, if you kind of look at the Brexit vote, where it wasn't necessarily a vote about politics, it was a vote about immigration. Um, but then at the same time, if you look at the statistics <laughs> of the population, there is not an immigration problem at all. Um, but it's for what the media is hyped and pushed to, I believe, you know what I mean, keep certain groups in society in a place or in a position. I mean, you know, to stop put certain people or certain groups of people rising up, I think. Um, but like I said, I think it's got, become a lot more sophisticated. They know what to say, how to say it, and when not to say what they need to say. Um, and so, yeah, it's just one of those things. I mean, I think it's become a lot more sophisticated. So the mentality of a lot of people are still the same. Um, but, like I said, um, on the surface, you can walk around and feel like it's better. But a lot of people say the microaggressions that we face on a day-to-day, -day, those are the ones where you suddenly see the crack in their veneer. It's like, you know, it's, you know what I mean? It's the, the side looks, the attitude that you get when you say a certain thing or you try to go to or do a certain thing, they're like, you know. Yeah. I mean, so I maybe, maybe the laws are helping a little bit because I think that more regulations now, so people are trying to do it in a clandestine way where they don't break the law as such. I mean, there, there's recourse now where there wasn't before. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I think I disagree. I think things are, I think for black people, Things have definitely got better. If you if you can lay a claim to being Black British, as in you know ex you know Commonwealth, ex colonize ex empire, whatever, I I do think the ground shifted definitely because I you know I'm I'm also a child of the seventies. I remember National Front everywhere. I remember walking past the chore on the walls. I remember feeling unsafe walking my neighbourhood where I was. Cross, so I don't think anyone would walk that day would have felt safe. But anyway, I remember feeling unsafe because of my colour. Um, I don't think our children feel that. However, I think there is a kind of, you know, it does feel a bit like the battleground shifted, you know, like there's a kind of, um, 
it just feels to me like people in power are always looking for a line to divide people. And it used to be colour. I don't think it is clearly that much anymore. Because I, I still remember when the BNP came out and said, oh, well, we're not talking about those hard-working West Indians. Of course, they're always, they're always all, they're like us. But it's those people, it's those Muslims. You know, like we keep moving the line about yeah. who's the other, really, on that. And so, and, and I think that's just a reaction to change and the fact that, you know, Britain is no longer a world power. It just wants to be but it isn't, and, and there's a kind of shrinking of influence, and there's a reaction to that. What America's excuse is, I don't know. But, you know, I think, I think globally there is, you can see it, there's a kind of, you know, in our failure to deal with, like, refugees and the migrants, you know, mostly in areas of wars that, you know, the West has caused. You know, we cause a, we cause a migration crisis, and then we just say, well, why are these people all coming over here? Because you bomb their country. You know, it's, like, really simple. These aren't complicated issues, but yet here we are acting like they did something to us. Yeah. When most people come here because they choose to come to England, it's because they either have family here, they have historical ties here, you at one point told them they were British, and they believed you, <laughs> you know, and, and, yes. and we're in this conversation. So, yeah, I mean, Windrush, the, the scandal was a massive setback, I think, and it kind of uncovered a way of thinking, I think, within the power structures that was, that was there's probably always been there, but just never proven. But I think that, you know, I, my, my encouragement is in the day-to-day, -day, I think it's easier. I think that, I think the definite, in terms of the powers who are making decisions about our lives, I'm not sure that's moved on in the way that we would have hoped. But that's maybe just because I found Swell, found that Swell of Braveman just became Home Secretary again, and I want to cry. So, <laughs> you know, what do you do? What do you do? You go around in circles with this. You know, we can't keep blaming the other, you know, but we do. Right. Does anyone else have any questions? Did you have any feedback to, so did you wait after a period of the filming to connect with those people that took part, the participants, to see how they were doing or did they did grow or sort of learn anything new from the experience of, from the filming? So the people that took part in it? Well, there was a fair gap between the filming and the actual film being finished, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. I can't remember when we finished it, but we didn't show it till like January. I think. God, was that this year or last year? This year. We showed, really? Yeah, it was January this oh year, but God. we. It's like 20 years but, ago. Right. But, no, yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't too long because I mean, we it, was, it was a few months. It wasn't. Yeah, it, was it wasn't a year or anything. Yeah, it was exactly. like three or four months. Um, yeah. And so we invited them to a screening, the launch screening, and. Um, and you know, good, at least half of them were able to come, and they were really, um, just really grateful to be involved. I think, and thankfully, no, no one thought they'd been misrepresented. <laughs> but um, I think, um, yeah, I think they really enjoyed being part of it. A few of them have come up and said um, how they haven't been able to get it out of their head, how they keep talking about, thinking about yeah. what they've said, thinking about what their experiences have been and how it started a much deeper conversation, perhaps within their circles about, you know, who they are and what their journey's been. So I think it's had some, yeah, ripple effect with the people in the film, which is really, which is really great, you know, because mm -hmm. these weren't people who, like, unthoughtful people, <laughs> but it, I think it just gave them an opportunity to sort of think about that in a way that perhaps they hadn't before, and, and see it in the context of other people. Yeah, and it's also some of the younger people have said that they would give very different answers now because they're a little bit older. So, or they could say, "No, I could talk a lot more about that now." <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. And when also as well, I mean, what we kind of noticed is that there was a kind of a gap in the ages of the people that we were able to get. Mm. So, from sixteen, I think it jumped to like twenty-eight. Yeah. <laughs> we were just like, "No, where's the nineteen twenties? Yeah. Where's that?" age range because um yeah it'd be interesting to really have got that full kind of coverage just to, to really see um because like i said now that those 16 and 15 year olds are now 17 18 um yeah they've started to say no there's more that they could say or they or they you know what i mean um would like to do it, you know that they, they you know, that they've experienced or they've remembered or whatever so yeah, I mean, I think obviously the older you get, the more 
as I think I've said, it's like more wisdom that you yeah. <laughs> accumulate over the time and then you, you get to reflect on the things that you would have brushed over as a child um, and then go, yeah, no, actually that was blatant. How did I miss that at the time? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think over time, I mean, yeah, but like Marcia said, yeah, people looked at him and like, a lot of them were like, they couldn't get out of their head and they wanted to, they just kept thinking about it. Yeah. It might be worth me visiting them again in five years' time to see how it's <laughs> 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 Yeah. Two and a half questions revisited. Yeah. 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 That'd be good. That'd yeah. be good. I like that. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I I think we might have to wrap it up, but thank you very much for coming all the way out here and showing us your brilliant. Oh no, we're happy to. Thank you. Thank you.